we're going to get this first session underway. Before we do, we just have a short video for you to watch. Uh, a greeting from uh, a dear uh, friend and Austrian colleague, who uh, I won't spoil the fun for you. Dear participants, Jews in Europe united for a better future. That is the topic of your conference. You will discuss various aspects, development, security, education, engagement and resilience, especially in relation to youth. United for a better future. That motto implies dedication and engagement. And I think it also implies something of great importance, that is, you, as Jewish Europeans, believe in a better future. You believe in the positive spirit of unity. I would like to encourage you. You are not alone in your endeavor. Many, many people in Europe want exactly the same. Unity and a prosperous future in the spirit of humanity, freedom, and tolerance. In order to achieve that, we constantly need to remind ourselves never again. That means for us, we will not allow hate, violence, or derision to be used as political instruments. Never again means to boldly counter attempts of nationalistic self-elevation and to strive for equality and unity within society. Never again means that we will thwart any attempt of attacking the rule of law or liberal democracy, and that we will defend the fundamental rights and freedoms on which our continent is built. Never again means, first and foremost, zero tolerance for racism, zero tolerance for anti-Semitism. In this spirit, I wholeheartedly wish you a successful conference and a positive, optimistic future to all of us. Some uh, lovely words from the President of Austria by way of introduction to our conference. I know we have uh, His Excellency from Austria here. If you could please pass on our sincere gratitude to the president uh, for his, uh, his warm words. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna hand over to the moderator for the first panel, which is Mr. Kalman Shalai, who is the director of the Action and Protection League, who's gonna take it from here. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, prior to start the panel discussion. Uh, I have the privilege to introduce you our first keynote speaker of this uh, promising afternoon. So, the Honorable Mr. Alan Carr, the United States Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism, was appointed by State Secretary Pompeo, the former Deputy District Attorney of Los Angeles County, prominent fighters of college campus anti-Semitism has been playing an important role in American Jewish community from the very beginning of his career. Nowadays, he's one of the most important advocates of Jewish cause, both on Capitol Hill as well as on international level. Here, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the special envoy for accepting our invitation for this event and now, let me give the floor to Mr. Alan Carr. Thank you so much. Thank you to the EJA and to the Consistoire and to my friends, Rabbi Margolin, Rabbi Kovesh, Kvoda Rabbanim, to, uh, to my friend Joel. Uh, thank you for your leadership. And if anyone needs an example of the power of leadership, well, just look at this building. I have to tell you, uh, uh, what, a, what a, a beautiful, stunning monument, monument to Jewish life and to Jewish optimism and to really a better future for all of us in Europe. 
And I'm so honored to be here and visit this place of beauty and of light and of openness. And I want to thank especially uh, not only you, Joel, but I want to thank Mayor Hidalgo for her support and for Paris' support and for naming uh, this place uh, Plaza Jerusalem. What a great statement that is about France's support for the Jewish community. She deserves a round of applause for sure, for sure. Um, excellencies and dear friends, I bring you greetings from the President of the United States and from my boss, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, leaders who are committed without nuance, without hesitation, and without equivocation to the cause that brings all of us here today. One year ago, I was appointed by President Trump and Secretary Pompeo to lead America's fight against this recurring, insatiable, inexhaustible human sickness that is Jew hatred, that is anti-Semitism. And we're seeing anti-Semitism rising throughout the world. It is unthinkable that 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, 75 years, only a few decades, since the Nazi crematoria stopped operating, we would see Jew hatred on the rise throughout Europe, throughout other parts of the world, and even in the United States. We're seeing the hatred of Jews rise among the ethnic supremacists of the far right. These are the venomous internet chat rooms, the awful torchlit rallies in some parts of Europe. It is one of the main sources of violence against Jews in certain Jewish communities. I had the great pleasure of visiting the wonderful and vibrant Jewish community of Strasbourg, whose delegates are here today. And I was told there that anti-Semitic incidences average one per week, most, not all, but most, from the far right. And so that's rising. We're seeing also a rise in anti-Semitism from militant Islam, which is the chief source of the more serious violence against Jews in most parts of Western Europe. It is the reason why last time when I visited Paris, when I came out of a synagogue, for Shabbat services, where I had the great privilege of being asked to speak, I was told to take my kippah off. Don't walk around the streets of Paris, I was told, with a kippah. Whether that's accurate advice or not, whether that's overkill or not, is not the point. The fact that Jews feel that way is unacceptable. And lastly, we are seeing anti-Semitism rise from the radical, anti-Zionist, Israel-hating far left. Now, because I have to return to Washington for meetings after my visit with you this morning, I was asked to incorporate some of the remarks I would have made in the afternoon panel that deals with anti-Zionism and the delegitimization of Israel. And so let me spend a few moments talking about why this form of anti-Semitism is so important to be addressed. I will tell you that in our work, on behalf of the United States, we do not rank the sources of anti-Semitism. We don't prioritize or minimize any of them. Jew hatred is Jew hatred. What difference does it make what ideological clothing it makes? What ideological clothing it disguises itself in or from which ideological camp it comes? It has to be combated. If two-thirds or even one-third of a tumor is left untreated, the patient doesn't do well. So if we're serious about fighting anti-Semitism, we must fight all of it, or else why bother fighting it at all? And so let me talk about why this so-called new anti-Semitism that couches itself as Israel hatred and anti-Zionism is so important. Reason number one is that Zionism is not a political movement. Zionism wasn't born out of some party politics in 1948 or in the first Zionist Congress. Zionism is as old as Judaism itself. Zionism was born in one of the earliest chapters in the book of Genesis where God says to Abraham, go forth to a land that I will show you. 
Zionism reached one of its early climaxes when Moses led the Jewish people to the promised land. And Zionism reached one of its early forms of longing. Longing, yes, for Zion. When the Babylonian captives wept on the banks of the Tigris and Euphrates, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand wither, imesh kachech Yerushalayim, tishkach yemini. That is what Zionism is. We are in a synagogue, after all. Across the hall is a synagogue, a beautiful synagogue filled with light. Every Shabbat, when the Torah is taken out of the ark, Jews everywhere in the world say, blessed is he who gave the Torah to his nation, Israel. That's what Zionism is. And so to, to demand that Jews extirpate Zionism from their core identity, to demand that Jews divorce themselves from that part of what it means to be Jewish is anti-Semitism, plain and simple. And we have to acknowledge that part of Jewish identity, and we have to embrace that part of Jewish identity. The second reason why it is so urgent also to confront this source of anti-Semitism is because, although it is often called the new anti-Semitism, there is nothing new about it. It is the same old medieval rot, simply repackaged and rebranded to suit current circumstances. In fact, every traditional manifestation of classic anti-Semitism recurs almost exactly in the same form with regard to the new anti-Semitism. Think about it, blood libels, as old as anti-Semitism itself, claiming that you know, Jews kill children and all of these horrific things. Blood libels today against the state of Israel, the Jew among the countries. The same rhetoric we heard throughout the years, same rhetoric today, a recent philosopher, a French philosopher, Jewish philosopher, was not too long ago called a dirty Zionist, as though the substitution of a word might confuse us as to what is actually meant. The same delegitimization. The Jew is the outsider, different, illegitimate, not having a seat at the table. The same economic boycotts. Kauft nicht bei Juden. What is the BDS movement if not that? Don't buy from the Jew among the countries. The same insane, pathological focus. A kid on a prestigious university campus gave me the answer sheet to his math class. And on that answer sheet, it says, you know, the derivative, the, integ the integral, so on. And then it says, another day in the occupied Palestinian territory, Zionist forces murdering children. And then it goes back to math. The kid who gave this to me said, in math class, I can't even escape this? That's right. Even in math class, because like the anti-Semitism of old, this new anti-Semitism is just as caustic, just as malignant, just as pathological in its focus. And finally, finally, you know what else is the same? Blaming the Jew. Blaming the Jew for the anti-Semitic response. We've had it all throughout history. Every pogrom, every orgy of hatred. Do you know even Kristallnacht? Even Kristallnacht was blamed on something a Jew did. And something real this time. No blood and matzah. Kristallnacht was blamed as a response on the assassination of a German diplomat by a Jewish kid, Herschel Greenspan. But we all know that's not true. Sure, that happened, but that's not why Kristallnacht happened. We understand that Kristallnacht was part of the strategy of Nazi Germany to destroy the Jewish people. Similarly, we have to understand that the hatred of Israel is not about things that Israel does. It's always blamed on things that Israel does, either, either fictionally or actually. You know, a building project here, a military operation there, something Prime Minister Netanyahu said, something Prime Minister Netanyahu didn't say but should have said, please. Anti-Semitism is never about the conduct of the victim. Crime is never about the conduct of the victim. It's always a problem of the perpetrator. And so let's get it straight. The new anti-Semitism, it isn't new. It's old, and it's bad, and we have to fight all of it. We have to fight all of it, or like I said before, why fight any of it? So let me tell you what our chief priorities have been in the last year, and as we work in 2020, it will surely be our chief priorities for the coming year. Number one, security. This conference is dedicated to protecting Jewish communities. 
Well, you protect Jewish communities in many ways, some of them offensive, but you cannot ignore the defensive. And so number one is security. The United States spends tens of millions of dollars every year to supplement the security needs of the Jewish community. The United Kingdom spends millions of pounds every year. Denmark spends money. It is one of my top policy priorities to ask that every country, that every country fulfill its obligations, the obligations that every sovereign has to help its communities be safe. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have safety, if you can't leave your house and know that you'll return in one piece or put your kids on a school bus and know that they're protected, there is no quality of life. Priority number one, security. Priority number two, the proper investigation, the proper prosecution, and the appropriate punishment of hate crimes. Not dismissal of hate crime charges on shoddy grounds like events in the Middle East or smoking marijuana. I used to prosecute hate crimes. You don't dismiss hate crimes charges for the reasons like that. Hate crimes charges have to be vigorously prosecuted. I had the great privilege of meeting with law enforcement leaders right here in France, as well as in Germany, and including in my own country in the United States, where we worked together on real solutions to fight hate crimes, not only at the felony level, but even at the misdemeanor level and below. For example, if you have a minor crime, a minor crime that has a flavor of ethnic hatred toward Jews or toward any community, don't let that defendant go unless that defendant is forced to undergo a tolerance program. As a prosecutor in my former career, I personally have sent minors and low-level misdemeanor defendants to tolerance programs, and I can tell you it has changed their lives. Consider that when we catch a kid, even a kid who did something minor, it is a priceless opportunity to intervene in that kid's life, thereby protecting not only future victims, but doing the best favor we could do for him. Because at the end of the day, it's he who needs help, who needs to be turned, who needs to be put on a path of justice. Hate crimes, priority two. Priority three is the IRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. If a country hasn't adopted it, it is my chief ask that a country do adopt it. I want to compliment and thank President Macron for his strong statements adopting the IRA definition for France and stating also what the IRA definition makes clear, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. I want to thank President Macron for being clear on that. I also want to make clear that that is the policy of the United States. One year ago at the APAC policy conference, Secretary Pompeo stood before 18,000 activists and he said anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Adoption of the IRA definition is critical. Number four, hateful incitement, especially on social media. We have got to deal, we have got to deal with the radicalization of our young people through the internet and social media. I'm not talking about censorship. I'm not talking about any limitation to freedom of speech. But incitement to violence is not protected speech, even in the United States where First Amendment protections are very broad. And when we're dealing with incitement to violence, we must act against it. Look, many of us here are parents. Would we ever dream of letting our children wander around neighborhoods of violence and filth and danger and drugs? We couldn't sleep at night. But do you know every day the children of the world are lured, are seduced into just such virtual neighborhoods? They're sucked into vortexes of hatred where they feed for years off of this venom and are radicalized and some of them turn to violence. We must address this because our children require that we address it. Five, education. And I want to thank Deputy Director General Giannini for focusing on education. She is correct. A recent CNN survey shows that fewer and fewer children, even here in Europe, have ever heard of the Holocaust or know what it is. The statistics from the United States aren't much better. And so we've got to do better in educating about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, but that's not all I mean. 
it's not enough to educate about anti-Semitism. If we really want to get serious, if we really want to win strategically the war against anti-Semitism, not only battles in that war, but the war itself, we have to fight the thing itself, not only its manifestations. And anti-Semitism itself is an idea. It's a worldview. It's a spiritual sickness. How do you fight that? Only through education. And education means an education in philo-Semitism. Why aren't we teaching our kids about the beautiful and profound and deep and inextricable contributions that the Jewish community has made to every country? You can't tell the history of the United States without talking about the Jewish contributions. Can you tell the history of France without talking about it? Or of England, or of Germany, or of Russia, or of Poland, and the list goes on. I had the great privilege of visiting the beautiful Pauline Museum in Warsaw, a treasure, a shining gem, an example of how kids can be educated in the beautiful contributions a Jewish community's made. Next year, the year 2021, Germany will commemorate 1,700 years of German history, German Jewish history, 1,700 years. I just returned from Germany and I asked my German friends and interlocutors, this is wonderful that you're doing it. What curriculum are you developing so that every kid in every classroom knows that it's not only 1,700 years, but knows what that contribution is? I asked how many German kids know not only that the Jewish history has contributed to Germany, but vice versa. How many German kids know? that the language, the vernacular language of Ashkenazi Judaism from Russia to England is a form of German? The answer is nobody. So let's get serious about it. Let all of our countries double down on this and understand that it is time to educate in philo-Semitism and push to every classroom in every city a curriculum that uplifts, that champions, and that educates on the Jewish history of our countries. Those are our policy priorities for the next year. And before I close, I want to leave you with some good news. Because it's very important to remember, as Joel, you said so beautifully, you said you started your remarks by saying I'm an optimist, and this building demonstrates that you're an optimist. Well, that's right. We have cause to be optimistic. So I don't want to leave this wonderful, important, urgent conference of leaders that you are, without ending on an optimistic note. I'll tell you this, if I weren't optimistic, I wouldn't have taken this job. And so there is reason to celebrate. Piece of good news number one is that the Jewish people are not alone. This isn't the 1930s. Rabbi Kovish said it so well, we have allies and partners and friends at all levels of government, from heads of government to ministers to parliamentarians and to anti-Semitism coordinators. Several of those are in the room today. I want to take a moment to point out how proud I am of my friendship and my ability to collaborate with uh, Préfet Frédéric Poitier of France, with Lord John Mann of the United Kingdom, who's here today. Yes, they deserve applause for everything they're doing. and so many others, so many others who get it, who are genuine and true champions of this cause. They don't pay lip service. It's not just rhetoric for them. They feel it, they believe it, and they lead. It's one of the reasons, Frédéric, that in every police academy in France and in every prosecution academy in France, cadets are now trained in hate crimes prosecution. Thank you to France and to Frédéric for his leadership. And this is just one example of many good developments that are happening all over the world. And thank you, John Mann, for a remarkable moment where ordinary Britons, ordinary rank and file people, voted the way they voted because they said they rejected anti-Semitism. They said they were embarrassed that their country might embrace anti-Semitism in so public a way. What an incredible moment that was for, for a rejection and a resounding rejection by a population of anti-Semitism. And again, 
due in part to the great leaders we have here today. So that's a piece of good news number one. We have friends and we have allies who are leading and making a difference. Piece of good news number two is that there is a state of Israel. The Jewish people do have self-determination. And the state of Israel is a shining example for the world of democracy and of decency and of innovation and of tikkun olam, making the world a better place. And the strength of the state of Israel, the strength of the Jewish state, makes the Jewish people stronger all over the world and makes it all that much easier to fight anti-Semitism. And finally, piece of good news number three is that despite rising anti-Semitism in my country, despite problems that we absolutely need to work on, and we are, the United States of America is still the most philo-Semitic country in history. And the United States today is led by the most philo-Semitic administration we have ever had. From President Trump to Vice President Pence to Secretary Pompeo and many other leaders, we have never had an administration committed to this extent, to the fight against anti-Semitism, to the protection of the Jewish people throughout the world, and to support for the state of Israel. Not just in rhetoric, thank you. Not just in rhetoric, but in deeds. Indeed, in refusing to fund vile anti-Semitic textbooks 